Welcome to Business Innovators Radio, featuring industry influencers and trendsetters sharing proven strategies to help you build a better life right now. Hi, this is Tammy Patzer, and I'm really pleased to introduce you to today's guest, Malcolm J. Brenner. Let me tell you a little bit about Malcolm. He's the author of Melchior, an interstellar affair, and we're going to talk about that book today. Let me tell you a little bit more about him. He was born in Perth Amboy, New Jersey in 1951, and he grew up in the suburbs of Philadelphia in the 1960s, where he attended both public and private schools. He graduated from New College in Florida in 1974 with a bachelor's degree in communications. Before he became a reporter, Malcolm worked as a truck driver, short order cook, a busboy, construction worker, dishwasher, cinematographer, freelance writer, and photographer, and his writing has appeared in Penthouse, Gnosis, New Realities, Technical Photography, and many more. In Florida, He actually worked for local newspapers, the Charlotte Sun, Boca Beacon, and Harbor Style Magazine. And previously, he actually worked among the Navajo and the Zuni Indians of New Mexico, where he worked for most of the 90s. And he was known for his accurate, sympathetic, and crusading reporting. His news stories, features, and satirical coyote columns won numerous awards, including 1995's Best of Show Award from the managing editors of the State Associated Press Association. He has won myriad journalism awards, and he actually has several books. Among them is Wet Goddess, published in 2010, Growing Up in the Oregon Box, Secrets of a Reikian Childhood, and the book that we're discussing today is Melchior, an Interstellar Affair. Welcome, Malcolm. Well, thank you, Tammy, and thanks for having me on. I'm I'm really excited to talk to you because I actually know you. We worked together at the Charlotte Sun uh, many years ago now, and so I, I know a little bit about you, but... I didn't really know uh, your background um, graduating from New College, which, of course, is a a very famous college in Sarasota, Florida. And then, of course, you wrote the book Wet Wet Goddess, which I guess really put you on the map because it was about a controversial topic. Tell us a little bit about Wet Goddess and then tell us about your new novel, The Melchior, and how did you come up with that particular theme. You went from dolphins to outer space. Mm -hmm. Well, Wet Goddess um, is sort of a piece of journalism, really, although I published it as a novel. I did that for basically legal reasons, uh, because most of the characters I'm writing about in the novel were based on people who are still alive. But that aside, Wet Goddess is the story of a college student who uh, gets an assignment to photograph the dolphins, a cheesy little uh, marine park in Florida, and ends up falling in love with uh, one of the female dolphins there who courts him aggressively for several months. And, and, and so that book put, basically put you on the map, and you currently live in Punta Gorda, Florida? Yes. So... As a writer, the, the new book that you have, The Melchior, an Interstellar Affair, number one, what does Melchior mean? Melchior is the name of the title character of the book, who is an alien. Oh, okay. So the book is about, uh, I guess, a human mar- marries a woman and she claims to have had this affair. So can you just kind of give us the outline of the story? Yeah, well, the book starts uh, on August uh, 5th, 1978, uh, with a group of uh, people, uh, government agents, looking for a crashed UFO in the mountains outside of Durango, Colorado. 
and watching them is a woman named Susie Louise McGonigal. And I should say that this is a novel. Uh, Susie uh, is a uh, learning to become a teacher like her mother and grandmother. She's a very shy, introverted woman who doesn't think she's very particularly attractive to men. And uh, she gets mixed up with her first husband, a uh, abusive character, uh, gets rid of him and uh, marries her second husband, an investigative reporter. And one night while they're lying around after watching an episode of The X-Files, she mumbles something that causes his universe to collapse. She mumbles that one night she was woken up uh, from a sound sleep while uh, in the mountains of Colorado at her family cabin by a man standing at the foot of her bed dressed in a strange silver suit. And he, uh, without saying a word, he persuades her to follow him into the darkness where she's taken aboard a crashed uh, flying saucer or spaceship, I really should say. It's not a flying saucer. It's an egg-shaped spaceship. And uh, her, her, her husband, uh, her second husband, is uh, utterly uh, astounded at this tale, uh, which he's never heard before from her. And uh, utilizing his skills as a reporter, uh, decides to try to figure out if her story is true or not. And that sets up a number of conflicts in the story that uh, drive it to its uh, inevitable conclusion. Wow. So you're not going to review whether or not uh, it really happened or not? Well, all my stories are based on things that really happened. And in Melchior, I give the reader a sample of an AP News story that was about a large uh, meteor that fell over the uh, western states on August uh, 2nd, 1978. And no trace of this meteor was ever found. No crater, no, no impact uh, event. Uh, no chunks of uh, broken meteor lying around, which uh, led the scientists to say it must have exploded in the air with such force that it completely vaporized. And this does happen uh, from time to time with a falling meteor. They're called a bolide when that happens. But um, the, the, the narrative of the book uh, is drawn from both my own experiences in my second marriage and various stories from people that I heard about their experiences with UFOs and my own deep reading in the uh, UFO subject matter field, including experts like John Keel, uh, Whitley Strieber, and Jacques Vallée. So, so this was actually inspired by a combination of your interests and your real life experiences woven into, into a, a novel form so can you, what's been going on w with your writing? Was it inspired uh, by your personal interests or what got you started on write? you know, going to such extremes um, in your writing? Is it because of your personal background? Well, when I was a kid, I read a lot of science fiction and I wanted to, grow up to become a science fiction writer. What I didn't realize is that to be a really good science fiction writer, you have to be pretty good at science, at least if you're going to make your stuff believable to most of the people out there these days. And I wasn't a very good scientist. I'm, I'm lousy at math, and I don't have the sort of um, detachment, I think, that a, a good scientist has about their subjects of study. So I sort of drifted into uh, writing, first of all, writing for magazines and then writing for newspapers. And finally, uh, after I retired in uh, 2011, I started, uh, excuse me, I retired in uh, 2008, I think. And uh, I started writing for myself, writing these books that I had always had in mind and wanted to, uh, wanted to get out. In the case of Melchior, it was a pretty fast book to write. It just took me a couple of, uh, really a couple of months. Uh, it came out very quickly because I'd been thinking about it for a long time, I guess. And I had the, uh, uh, the plot and the storyline pretty well laid out in my mind and just figured out how to uh, put those thoughts into words on paper. And uh, it's turned out to be uh, an interesting book. I've gotten uh, one review of it so far from a very kind reviewer. Uh, she liked it very much. 
and uh, I'm hoping for more. Good. So who who do you think would really appreciate this book the most? Well, I think, first of all, anybody who appreciates uh, science fiction stories will appreciate it. It uses a couple of common themes in uh, modern science fiction, uh, the uh, crash spaceship, uh, the alien lover. But I think it does so in a new and different way. I think people who are fascinated by um, the whole question of uh, extraterrestrial life and whether uh, UFOs are, are extraterrestrial craft would be interested in it. And finally, people who like a good love story may like it, too, because uh, it plays out on several levels in that regard. So you said that part of this was taken from some real life experience. Have you had any extraterrestrial type experiences? I have never even seen so much as a UFO, although I did take some pictures of some very strange aerial uh, phenomena going on in 1978. Unfortunately, I've lost them because I uh, sent them to a UFO investigator for analysis, and he never sent them back to me, the bastard. <laughs> so tell me more about your creative process. I think a lot of times, uh, you know, people are very interested in authors, and, and like you said, you thought about this book for quite some time. So can you describe a little bit more about your creative process? Well, it's probably very disorganized. I'm not writing these books to make a living. I'm not turning them out uh, for a paycheck, principally because I've never been able to find a publisher to publish my work. It's all self-published. And I do that through a local printing company, which has been very helpful to me, uh, Royal Palm Press. I don't mind mentioning them here. But um, the creative process has really been different uh, with every book. Um, suffice to say that these are stories that I feel that I have on my chest and uh, I have to get rid of them or discharge them some way. And that's what's motivated me to tell them. Uh, as far as organizing my writing goes, um, it's definitely gotten better over the years, I think, as uh, demonstrated by the facts that my books have gotten uh, somewhat shorter and uh, more, more condensed. Uh, Wet Goddess, the, uh, the dolphin novel, took me 37 years to write. I mean, that was a long time. I threw away like three drafts and uh, put it aside uh, in 1981. I started writing it in 1973, shortly after I had the experiences with the dolphin that I describe in the novel. And a scientist named John C. Lilly, whom I was communicating with, writing to, uh, encouraged me to uh, write the book. He thought it might have a beneficial effect on the whole question of whether we should keep dolphins in captivity or not, which I think is wrong to do. Um, so I started working on it in 1973. I worked on it in a kind of disorganized manner until 1981, at which point I was getting rejection slips back from publishers and I couldn't handle them. I was very more sensitive to that kind of thing back then. So I put it aside for 13 years and then I picked it up again in 1994 when I heard that uh, the movie Flipper was being remade and uh, began working on it again and worked on it for uh, uh, another uh, 94, six, 16 years before I got what I felt was an acceptable result and uh, published it in 2010. So when you published Wet Goddess, um, what was the public reaction? It was phenomenal for a book with no advertising budget. Um, I was very lucky in that I had the services of a uh, press release company at the time that uh, charged the people who receive the press releases. Normally, the person who writes the press release and wants to get the information out is the one who pays the bill for it. But in this case, uh, it was free for me. And the press release uh, did a tremendous job of getting the word out there. And for about two weeks after that, I was flooded with uh, requests for interviews on radio shows and blogs and uh, a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, media attention. So w I, I want to stick to Wet Goddess for a little bit because yeah. I, I know that it's a controversial book because of the topic, because it's about a relationship between a human and a dolphin. But 
part of, if I'm understanding you correctly, the reason why you wrote the book is really to talk about the fact that dolphins are highly intelligent and they should not be kept in captivity. So did it help to promote the cause of helping people to realize that dolphins and whales and mammals um, are, are animals that shouldn't be in captivity? I know I've, I've noticed on social media that often you'll talk also post things about protecting the, the killer whales and things like that. Right. The killer whale is just a large species of dolphin, really. Mm -hmm. um, has it done? I, I, it sold about 1,400 copies, and I estimate that a lot more people than that have read the book because uh, it's uh, it gets loaned around a lot. I've observed that among my friends who have it. They'll loan out a copy, and they'll lose it, and they'll buy another copy, and they'll loan it out, and they'll lose that one, so they buy a third copy, <laughs> which, of course, is great for my sales, but it's not so great for them. Uh so a lot of people, I think, have read it. Um, it has it done any good? The place, the, the places where the worst exploitation of dolphins and whales is going on right now is in the Far East. It's in Asia. It's happening in China and in Japan and in a lot of country, countries like that, Indonesia, where uh, dolphins are kept under really terrible conditions. There's nothing like the American Marine Mammal Protection Act there to uh, protect them from the abuses or the uh, insufficiencies of their environments, their human-made environments. And uh, I, I can't say as it's done any good as far as I can tell. I've received some kind words about it and people who support me. But seeing the widespread global exploitation of, of dolphins uh I would have to say no it hasn't done it hasn't done that much good perhaps what we need is a Japanese or even a Chinese translation the book was translated into Russia by a uh, enthusiastic fan into Russian and uh I'm supposed to be getting a report in another couple of months from him on how it's selling over there oh well so that's... how that goes because the Russians are also involved in capturing dolphins and whales for uh captivity mm-hmm yeah. Well, that's a start. I mean, yeah. because obviously Russia is a huge, um, a huge place. But of course, if it was, you know, Japanese or Chinese or, or whatever different translations. So what's next for you? Do you have another project in mind? Um, my daughter has been encouraging me to write a book about my time as a reporter on the Navajo Nation. Uh, she thinks that would be very interesting. And I just might do it. I have all my clips, my newspaper stories from that period of time. And I have some journals that I kept. Oh, and wow. I might, uh, might go ahead and write that up. That would be called Wings of Stone if I do, which is the Navajo name for this uh, pinnacle of rock that stands out on the uh, desert outside of a town called Shiprock. Uh, uh, the Navajo name for it is uh, Sabatai, which is wings, wings of Stone because the rock has these three huge uh, walls of, of rock uh, called lava dikes by geologists that extend out from it and run for many miles across the desert. It's an imposing and, and very haunting sort of place, a very, very strange spectacle. Oh, interesting. Uh, and uh, I do not know very many people personally who have Wikipedia, and I actually found you on Wikipedia, and there was a little note that was interesting related to your time as a reporter there it said that you actually had been fired for practicing wicca yeah i was fired the first newspaper i worked for the farmington daily times was run by a evangelical fundamentalist christian and uh i wasn't the only wiccan working for him but i was the only one who was um relatively out about it and i say out because i didn't want to challenge this guy or his faith but he assigned me a story to investigate a, a local in Farmington who claimed that the town had Satanists in it who were practicing satanic rituals in the canyons outside the town. So I went to investigate this guy and found out that his story was a bunch of BS and that he was probably uh, creating the very incidents that he was uh, 
trying to get me to report on because he had what's known as Munchausen syndrome by proxy. Oh, okay. This is where firemen start fires so they can have the honor of putting them out, things yes. like that. Yeah, so this guy was starting these rumors of Satanism in the same way so he could be uh, responsible for uh, extinguishing them and get all the fame and glory. So um, where were we? <laughs> oh, oh, well, we were talking about the, the fact that you were oh, um, yeah. fired well, anyway, before he, that. This guy, this guy after, after, my, after the story blew up on him, uh, he turned me into the publisher of the newspaper. And the publisher of the newspaper ordered the uh, the editor and the uh, the managing editor to get rid of me and make it look like it was my fault. So they contrived this big story about how I had threatened another reporter and that I was violent. And they threw me out. And they fired me. And uh, I went to the uh, EEOC and filed a federal discrimination complaint against them, which got hung up for months in the system. They couldn't decide whether it was a second, uh, a First Amendment right that was violated or my, uh, uh, my job rights. And by the time they got around to issuing a decision in my favor, they had decided they wanted to drop the case. It was very hard for me to find a lawyer uh, to go against this publisher because he had uh, a lot of resources at his disposal. So I ended up um, bringing a case against him with an incompetent lawyer and getting the case thrown out of court. It never got heard. Interesting. Uh, but later on, later on, there was a class action suit against the publisher and several other reporters who had been fired for similar reasons because they were practicing faiths he didn't agree with. Uh, sued him for, I think, $75,000 and won a case. But uh, I wasn't allowed to join that case because my case had already been thrown out. Oh, interesting. Well, I know that many people, uh, because of Tony Hillerman, many people are familiar with, you know, when you talked about Farmington and Shiprock and all those, mm -hmm. because I read Tony Hillerman books, I, you know, I have an image in my mind so it would actually be very interesting to, you know, Tony Hillerman fans, especially to have another voice coming yeah. out of uh, out of that area because the location is part of what makes all of his stories so fascinating, and then yes. the, the culture and and all of that uh, Native American history and everything. So I'm really looking forward to to you um, writing those books. And it sounds like books with an S to me, hmm. um, because you were there for such a long time. And it sounds like you have a lot of uh, really good information to share. I'm, I'm personally looking really forward to that. So, well, I just want to say something really quickly okay. since you mentioned Tony Hillman. I too had read uh, several of Tony Hillman's books before I went out to the Navajo Nation. Nothing you read can compare you for the reality of the place. That's all I can say. Oh, wow. I think you've read about it is true. All the good things and all the bad things, but they are true in spades. Mm -hmm. And just reading about them. And the Navajos could really use the tourism. It's mm -hmm. one of the few ways they have of making money out there. So if you get a chance to go out there sometime, by all means, uh, pay a visit to the Navajo Nation and go see some of the wonderful scenery and uh, some of the very interesting customs that they have out there. Oh, I would love to do that. I drove um, through on the way. Um, I drove out to Oregon, and when I came back, I came through that route, but it was January, so I, oh, yeah. I couldn't really go too far off the path. You can't go anywhere off the path. <laughs> <Snow. stuck. laughs> <laughs> so, well, that's really interesting. Like I said, I'm really looking forward to those and um, you've got, you know, Wet Goddess, you've got the Melchior and Interstellar Affair growing up in the Oregon box. Um, very interesting. So if people want to find out more about you, your projects, and to buy your books, where would you suggest they go? Well, um, two of my books can be bought as trade paperbacks on Amazon. Those are Wet Goddess and the new one, Melchior. Uh, all, of them can, uh, all of them except Melchior can be bought uh, as eBooks on Smashwords. Uh, that's Wet Goddess and uh, Growing Up in the Orgone Box. 
And um, if they want to follow me, uh, I have a blog at malcolmbrenner.com. It's a blog. Uh, it's my official blog for my, my publishing and uh, business purposes. I used to have a blog, but the, uh, my, uh, my status with the uh, provider uh, expired, and I have yet to renew it. So I hope to have another blog, a personal blog, uh, for my own experiences up soon. Great. So you can buy the books on Amazon mm -hmm. or Smashwords. Yes. Follow you at MalcolmBrenner.com. Brenner mm -hmm. And again, your books, the, the cool thing about you, Malcolm, is I think the fact that you do weave the your life into your fictional stories and the fact that your books are controversial, it makes people stop and think about things that they might not ever think about and for example, the, the status of the dolphins. We should be concerned about how different animals are treated and not just in the United States, but around the world. So even though it's a controversial topic, it, it, it does shine light on that. And then who doesn't like a good science fiction story mm -hmm. and, or, and a love story mixed together because you know, those are all things that we're all interested in. And then you did have a very unique uh, childhood, to say the least. Yeah. Um, and again, um, like I said, I personally am really looking forward to to your Navajo, Navajo and Zuni Indian stories. Uh, and I can see that those will probably be your legacy uh, to help the Native Americans tell their story. Um, that's just my initial feeling about that. Is there anything else that you would like our listeners to know before I let you go? Well, if they want to go and look at some videos I've made, they're on YouTube. Uh, I made a couple of videos just for fun. One of them is called Pugsley Jumps the Fence. It's about my little, my late little dog escaping from a six foot high, uh, hurricane fence. Oh uh, a couple of others are, I made a couple of, uh, movies about dolphins. One of them is about a visit to the Dolphin Research Center in Grassy Key, Florida. And the other is about an expedition I made to the, uh, to the Bahamas in 2005 to go swimming with wild dolphins. And that was a very beautiful and wonderful experience for me. And do you have a YouTube channel? Uh, yeah, it's just under my name. It's Malcolm Brenner. Okay. I'll include that in our show notes so that people can easily find these. I love that Pugsley jumps the fence. <laughs> that sounds so cute. It so, is. It's very well, funny. Malcolm, thanks a lot. I really appreciate you taking all this time with me today. And again, I'm really excited about all your book projects. And I hope that we can talk again real soon. I hope so too, Tammy. And thanks for having me on again. Thank you. This is Tammy Patzer. Go make it a great day. Thanks for listening to Business Innovators Radio. To hear all episodes featuring leading industry influencers and trendsetters, visit us online at businessinnovatorsradio.com today.